Training camp is a little over three weeks away. Now, I'm not going to try and sell you guys with some magic beans that football is back when training camp is here. But if you are excited for the pads to come back on, hit that thumbs up button to start today's video. What's going on, everyone? Welcome on into the Cleveland Browns Report. Coming up on today's episode, I want to run through my top five offseason moves the Browns made as we are gearing up for training camp in just a few short weeks. So without further ado, coming in at number five, I've got reworking Nick Chubb's deal. Now, you can make an argument for this to be much lower on the list, but I always felt like this was a bit of an obvious uh, shoe-in candidate to get done over the offseason, so I'm not going to praise the Browns too much for getting what should have been done no matter what done, but let's refresh everyone's memories on the Nick Chubb new contract. I guess the proper term is restructure, but I always hate restructure because people use that term to apply to a lot of different things, but Chubb agreed to a new contract which created about $10 million in cap savings, and it also gave Chubb about $2 million in new guaranteed money because his previous deal did not have guaranteed money. He could have been cut, gained nothing, and then who knows what he could have gotten in free agency. Now, this new contract also reduced his base salary by about $10.6 million. It brought his base salary down to the vet minimum so the Browns could lower his cap hit. Now, as a result of that, the Browns also put in a bunch of incentives for him to make up all of that base salary that he forfeited. So let's look at the incentives that Nick Chubb has in front of him, which I don't think he would have agreed to this if he didn't feel confident about having a good shot to reach these incentives, which means he must feel confident that he'll be on the field earlier in the year. If he gets to a little over 1,000 yards, 50 to be exact, $900,000 right to the bank account. And as you see, it goes up and up when he gets to 1200 another 900 k added to the bank account. All of this, by the way, came from the Orange and Brown report. What about touchdowns? If he gets to 10 touchdowns, add in an extra $900,000. And when he gets to 12, an extra 900, so on and so forth. And making the playoffs and getting to 10 touchdowns, 250000 So he could make up to $3 million in incentives just by putting together 15 touchdowns and making the playoffs alone. All right, now what for? What about All Pro and Pro Bowl and playoffs and stuff like that? Uh, if he's an All Pro this year, one point five million dollars. If he's an All Pro and the Browns make the playoffs, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So ultimately, the Browns could not let Nick Chubb leave Cleveland. I did not think that there was going to be a great chance of this going south and the Browns moving on from Nick Chubb. Maybe in January or February, I had some hairs in the back of my neck standing up, but. Just based on the language the Browns used to describe Nick Chubb and his contract situation, it always seemed like there was a lot of motivation on both ends to get something done. Nothing's ever a guarantee in sports, but this was close to it. So really excited the Browns were able to get Nick Chubb's contract reworked and back in Cleveland for 2024 as he was originally scheduled to be. But of course, big cap hit coming off a knee surgery that could set up some barriers. So with all that being said, I wanted to look at my top five Browns in my lifetime. Now, this is a little bit of a unique list to me based on my age and growing up and watching this team. But I've got Nick Chubb and Miles Garrett in this list as kind of the new era of Browns football. Joe Thomas for just being a Hall of Famer. I don't think there has to be much more said about that. Joel Petonio for serving as a really great bridge player from the rough days of 2014 to 2017-ish. And then staying with the team through all the new success they have had. Plus, he's been with the Browns the longest, over a decade now. And then Josh Cribbs, this one just kind of, uh, you know, speaks to the earlier days of watching this team. So maybe you've got someone else on your list, but for me, in my lifetime, those are the top five Browns players. Now, who is your favorite Browns player of all time? I think Nick Chubb's an excellent candidate for this answer, uh, but let me know who you think down below in the comments. Moving on to number four for offseason moves, I'm going to go with the defensive line transactions. I'm just going to kind of lump them all together because the Browns made a handful of D-line additions and then subtractions, and I want to recap the good ones that they made. So last year, they went into the offseason with Zadarius Smith, Shelby Harris, Maurice Hurst, and Jordan Elliott all set to be free agents going into this past offseason, or this offseason, I should say now. And the Browns had to make some decisions. 
who to bring back, who to let walk. And I think they made the absolute correct decisions. They brought back Zadarius Smith, Shelby Harris, and Maurice Hurst, and they let Jordan Elliott walk and sign with the 49ers in free agency. And I could not agree more with the three guys they brought back and the one guy they let walk. Why? Because look at just the pro football focus ranks from last year. PFF is not the only way to define a player, but man, you've got Zadarius Smith, 16th out of defensive end. Shelby Harris and Maurice Hurst coming in 13th or 31st. Uh, and then you've got Jordan Elliott climbing in at 112th. And by the way, Jordan Elliott signing for way more than what Maurice Hurst got. So yeah, I think this is an absolute no-doubter. The Browns got the right three defensive linemen back, and they let Jordan Elliott go on to the 49ers for more money than what they paid Hurst when Hurst was better last year, in my humble opinion, all year long. Now, before we get on to the next couple of off-season moves, we are racing the Ravens rundown this month in subscribers to the next milestone, the next 1,000 mark. Now, we're a little under 300 subs away from 35,000, but they've got a slight lead on us starting the month off, a little under 150 away from reaching 17,000. So we've got some ground to make up, but I believe in the dog pound. Go ahead, hit the sub button down below if you hate the Ravens. Third off-season move the Browns made that I loved, Signing Jameis Winston. Now, I would have loved to have seen Joe Flacco come back from just the nostalgia element of like what he was able to do in such a short time with the Browns. That was awesome to see. Ultimately, they decided to go with Jameis Winston. But I do think adding a high-level backup quarterback is really important. Not just because Deshaun Watson had some rocky starts to his time in Cleveland, but the fact is, 75% of teams have had their starting quarterback miss four-plus games in a season going back to 2021. It's not a 50-50 chance. Like, you are likely going to miss your starter for a good chunk of the season. So for the Browns to acknowledge that and not just keep their fingers crossed that Deshaun Watson can play the entire season and not miss a game, but instead to be proactive about it and go get a real legit backup in Jameis Winston, that's awesome. Plus, the Browns are just cursed at the quarterback position. Uh, since the return over two decades ago, they have only had three quarterbacks play an entire season. Tim Couch in 2001, Baker in 2019, and in 2020. So it's a pretty worthy investment in a good backup quarterback like Jameis, who, of course, the former first overall pick, has been mostly a backup the last four years in New Orleans. He started the year off as the starter in 2021, unfortunately tore his ACL and then lost the starting gig to Andy Dalton. And then they brought in Derek Carr and we didn't see much of Jameis the last two plus years. But the last time he was a true starter, he was a part of the 30 for 30 club, 30 touchdowns, 30 interceptions, over 5,000 yards. The Browns have two quarterbacks on their roster who have led the NFL in passing. I think we've talked about this before, but that's got to be a first. So for the Browns to bring in Jameis, I just think it's a really smart move to invest wisely in a backup job that's really important for the reasons we just went over. And before we look at numbers two and one on my list, if you want to get a Jim Brown jersey in your closet, they're 25% off at chatsports.com slash Jim Brown. Now, I know you guys already forgot what I just said, so I put all that information in the comments and description of today's video. But get your hands on a Jim Brown jersey today and get yourself the best new Browns gear out there. Coming in at number two, I've got trading for Jerry Judy. I was very excited about this trade when it went down. Um, I felt like Jerry Judy had some disappointing years in Denver for reasons that were out of his control constant turnover at the quarterback position, constant turnover at the head coach position, constant turnover at the play calling position. And despite all that, yeah, Jerry Judy probably hasn't looked like the 15th overall pick in the draft, but let's not pretend that like 972 yards and six touchdowns two years ago is a bad stat line for a wide receiver. And when he missed 10 games in 2021, only putting up 467 yards, but Despite that, like bouncing back the next two years. And yeah, he has not lived up to the true billing of what Denver had in mind when they took him first round. But he has been far from a disappointment or like a major bust or anything like that. And now the Browns are poised to have a really good receiving core. They are one of four teams that have three 
600 plus yard wide receivers from last season. Joining the Seahawks with DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, and JSN. Then you got the Texans with Stephon Diggs, Tank Dell, and Nico Collins. And then finally, the Titans putting together DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, and Tyler Boyd. It's the only teams with three 600 plus yard wide receivers. And sure, it also cost them a little bit more than just a trade. They gave up, or they gave Judy, I should say, a three year, $52.5 million extension, which we can't really grade until this season is over whether or not that was a good deal. But if Judy puts together a strong 800 plus five, six, seven touchdown season right before he would go into free agency, he probably would have gotten a lot more than $17.5 million. So for the Browns to kind of beat the wide receiver market, which has only exploded since then, with a lot of guys topping $30, $30 million, for the Browns to get this done now, they are betting on Jerry Judy. And if Judy's a disappointment this year, then this is going to look like a horrendous contract. But if Judy is just solid, $17.5 million in this day and age for a wide receiver is an absolute bargain. So over or under 1,000 yards for Jerry Judy this upcoming season. Can the Browns have 2,000-yard wide receivers with Amari Cooper and Jerry Judy? I think they're going to pass the ball a lot in this new Ken Dorsey offense. Put me in for the over club, baby. Coming in at number one, it's a bit of a surprise, but I'm going to go with drafting offensive lineman Zach Zinter. I'm going to stick my neck out here and go with maybe a little bit of an unconventional, unpopular best move of the offseason. But I really do believe the third-round pick out of Michigan, Zach Zinter, is going to go down as one of Andrew Barry's best draft picks. He was a four-year starter at Michigan, unfortunately suffered a broken leg, oddly enough, from his new teammate Michael Hall in the Ohio State-Michigan game. But last year, before getting injured in the final regular season game, he gave up all of zero sacks, and was penalized zero times. The guy was an all-American offensive lineman, and I just feel like this is going to be a pick that we look back on in a few years and go, man, the Browns have always been wise and tough in the trenches, and they've got a really good player in Zach Zinter. Now, unfortunately, the Browns' offensive line at the guard position is getting up in the age column. So for Cleveland to go out and get Zinter, I just feel like this is going to be a move that we look back at and go, man, what a fantastic addition by the Browns. Super excited for his future on this team because I think it's going to be a starting role and it won't be too long until he is starting for the Browns. But Zach Zinter, I just feel like, has future Pro Bowl talent written all over it. And I know that picking Zach Zinter as the best offseason move is probably not one you'll see from other commentators and YouTubers and whatnot. But mark me down as a believer and as someone that – We'll look at it in a few years and think, the Browns got Zach Zinter in round three, that perennial Pro Bowl guard that's going to be an anchor on this offensive line for 10 years. Yeah, I'm putting out some really big and tough expectations for Zinter to reach, but I think he's going to reach them. So what do you guys think with the best move the Browns made this offseason? Is it trading for Judy? Someone I left off my list? Let me know down in the comment section the best move Cleveland made this offseason. All right, we're going to pick a card to wrap up today's show. We've got producer Joey Peterson hanging out with us. Sorry if my eyes were kind of darting all over the place. Between you and me, I've got France Belgium on the TV behind the camera. So <laughs> I felt like every single time they got near the goal, I was like, whoa. Uh, but, Joey, which card do you want to go with? Three of spades. Three of spades. I'm going to go with the uh, seven of clubs. What would you say again? Three of spades. Three of spades. Wow. Damn it. I've got some work to do to catch up to the producers now before the offseason ends. That's also the worst reaction I've ever seen from someone getting one out of 52 chance correctly. Just going with a wow. I, I felt confident. You felt confident? Yeah. I, I would love to see you at Vegas just putting all of it on like Black 31 and being like, no biggie. I'll take my $5,000 in winnings right now. All right. That will do it for us on today's show. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. We're going to sign off and see everyone later.